Uh, this symposium is designed mainly to uh, highlight the newer uh, advances that have come up uh, in in our phaco emulsification techniques, as well as the way we operate, the way we visualize uh, cataract surgery uh, 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 from the microscope and now uh, without the microscopes on and so forth. So, uh, I'll I'll start uh, with uh, my case presentation. Uh, uh, of course, this uh, I do. We re do receive research grant support from Alcon Laboratories, and uh, this session is supported by uh, uh, Alcon, uh, uh, as uh, everyone knows. Uh, so this was a 27-year-old female with a unilateral posterior polar cataract and pre-existing defect, and we prefer femtosecond cataract surgery in such situations uh, with this kind of lens division pattern, the central uh, cylindrical lens division pattern. And we published this uh, way back in 2014-15, where we found that this femto delineation, where we do not do any form of uh, hydro procedures, has helped us to reduce our rupture rates down from seven to eight percent with the inside-out delineation to about four percent in the uh, uh, non-in in the, in the femtosecond delineation technique. And this animation was created by my colleague Dr. Samresh to show that these cylindrical lens division patterns act as cushions. So you remove each from the support of the other so that until the last point, until the last epinuclear plate is removed, there is a constant support to the posterior polar cataract, which will make sure uh, that the posterior polar part is protected uh, until the very end uh, of surgery uh, uh, as late as possible. So notice here in the anterior segment OCT, is, it does show a, a pre-existing defect with already some lens matter in the, uh, in the anterior vitreous. The aim is now to make sure that this doesn't progress any further or this doesn't extend or lead to a drop nucleus or to come to a situation where in the bag aisle implantation may be difficult. So therefore, use low parameters. I'm using an IOP of 30 and a flow rate of 20. An IOP of 30 is equivalent to a bottle height of about 50. And I'm detaching this epinuclear plate, but not removing it. So this will create a communication between the anterior and the posterior compartments. So now slow amount of fluids will start trickling it. So now at this point of time, even if you come out and do gentle hydro dissection, uh, it will not lead to a further rupture of the capsule. Of course, with an open capsule, you want to avoid as many, no, if possible, no hydro maneuvers at all. And slowly but surely, we are able to remove uh, these epinuclear plates, one from the support of the other. You can notice this pre-existing hole that is already existing. Bimanual irrigation aspiration has a distinct advantage. And the main advantage I find with the peristatic system is you can separate the flow rate from the vacuum. So here I'm working at a very low flow rate of 16 to 18 cc per minute. Uh, make sure that the closed chamber is being maintained and at, even while changing hands with irrigation and aspiration, dispersive viscoelastic, uh, viscose in this case is uh, the viscoelastic of choice uh, to make sure that the open area is tamponaded. Uh, and uh, uh, again, making sure uh, that the tear doesn't extend. So now you have this pre-existing tear uh, if you can, the best way to make sure that this remains stable is to convert it into a posterior capsulorexis. Because if you leave it like this and you try and inject an IOL in the back thinking that this is a small defect, this can easily split when you inject the IOL and then you can have a single piece IOL, stable IOL in the back. So I'm trying to encompass the plaque area as well. Uh, so trying to convert that tear into a posterior capsular excess strong margin and trying to encompass that uh, plaque area so that the patient has a clearer visual axis. And you do need support of micro incision holding rexis forceps. Uh, and you change your hands from one hand, one side port to the other. Uh, always make sure that you uh, make sure that there is no vitreous disturbance and preservative free time alone is the way to go. Fortunately, there wasn't. And now you have an intact anterior posterior capsule rexis and posterior capsule rexis. And this patient required a high astigma, had high astigmatism. So T7 was planned for this patient. But because we have strong margins, we can still consider going inside the back. Uh, and uh, fortunately, with these IOs, the stability is, is, is well known to be very stable. Uh, and even in uh, open posterior capsules like this, we have our publication for pediatric toric cataract uh, with the open PCCC done. So we are fairly confident that this IOL is going to remain in its place where we are leaving it uh, with a nice anterior and posterior capsular axis. And this is the patient uh, now has followed up six months uh, without any rotation or decentration. So I think 
uh, maintaining uh, the contours and femto delineation really helps in such situations. Another similar case of a posterior polar cataract young patient who wanted, who's never experienced breast biopia. So we had counseled that if everything goes as per plan, we may consider a multifocal toric, uh, uh, trifocal toric for you. Uh, and uh, we go ahead with the same principle, start with the low IOP and a low flow rate. So that even if everything happens slowly, it happens under your control. So nothing happens out of control. You can use a va appropriate vacuum. So that's the uh, advantage that separate from the vacuum. Uh, and generally, we would be using in infinity, say, 90, 100 bottle height as a standard. But we are able to work at much lower uh, uh, bottle heights, uh, up approximately 45 to 50, which will reduce the turbulences occurring in the anterior chamber, which will make sure that uh, this, this uh, uh, you know, uh, weak area in the posterior capsule doesn't rupture. Once again, making sure that we detach the epinuclear plate, not remove it completely so that uh, communication is being created. Uh, and fortunately, things went off well, even in this case, uh, the capsule was intact. But sometimes you try to get over, you, you think too highly of yourself and you get overconfident. And I thought maybe this is the case where I can, you know, even polish this plug because I'm planning a, a multifocal IOL in this case. Uh, and the moment you touch this delicate posterior capsule, that's it, you're gone. So the moment I tried to be over smart, I created a complication where nothing was there. Now, at this point of time, the easiest thing is to panic. Do not panic. Do not withdraw your irrigation. Inject dispersive viscoelastic to plug so that the chamber doesn't collapse. And now is, is an option for you, since there is no vitreous disturbance, to try and convert this to a strong posterior capsular excess margin. Uh, so, although we had counseled the patient that if, if things don't go as per plan, we will go for a monofocal IOL. But if we can convert this into a strong posterior capsule versus margin, uh, uh, you can give it, you can, you know, and you need to convert it from both, not just from one side. So, we were able to convert it into a strong margin. Uh, and uh, then you can still now consider with a trifocal toric IOL uh, as we went ahead in this case uh, in the back. Uh, and uh, uh, like I said, that the stability of these IOLs post-operatively is not an issue of concern. So this is the patient uh, at the end of the surgery, uh, strong anterior and posterior capsular excess, and this is uh, the follow-up at four months. So I'd like to end my talk here. And uh, I think the role of uh, femtosecond, uh, particularly for such posterior polar cataracts, is something that we find very useful in our practice and something that we like. And we will push the patient in our language that for you, this technology is definitely a little bit safer compared to, say, an average routine cataract, uh, where probably it may not matter even in, uh, uh, in the best of hands. So, uh, but thank you so much for the patient listening. Uh, and because uh, we, we have very limited time, I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Naren Shetty, uh, who will be talking to us about uh, 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 ingenuity and 3D uh, uh, visualization. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shahil. I think, uh, I mean, wonderful videos and every point I completely second that. Okay, let's begin. Just one sec. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can see. Fantastic. Uh, but uh, we are waiting for the PPT. Oh, yeah. I, I have only videos. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, all right. Okay. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on this onset, I'd like to thank uh, Alcon and AIOS for giving me this opportunity. I just want to talk about uh, my experience or let's say overall experience of a cataract surgeon doing a surgery on a 3D system. Here you can see me uh, operating on a very soft cataract. And yes, you can do a direct chop in all grades of cataract. I mean, especially even in these soft kind of cataracts. This is, uh, this in this, uh, in this and, case, I've been uh, using- no, video is not visible to me, video. I don't know whether it's the case with everybody, yeah, but I can't see you. Oh, okay, let me just begin again. Now you share your video screen. Hmm. Uh, Dr. Narin, I guess you shared the folder. So first open oh. the video and then share it. I checked, I select the VLC player. Is it, is it? Yeah, now, it now, now we can see. Yes, now we can. Okay. Thank you. All right, so you can do a 
chops in these kind of soft cat tracks. The crucial point is one is you always, this is a more of a mechanical chop and is done only under irrigation. And uh, the second important point to get a direct chop in soft cat tract is you have to do it slow. Don't try to hurry because when you hurry, it cheese wires and you won't get a perfect separation. So uh, let's go to the next. Now you're looking at an NS2 grade of cataract. Uh, obviously chopping, chopping is so much more easier. A small tip in uh, when, whenever you do chop, uh, when, let's say when you've got a good hold onto the nuclear. Your video is frozen again. Sorry, Norin, to interrupt you, but you, I think your video is frozen I, again. Yeah, I think I'll... Uh, yes. Just one second. <clears throat> I think I'll just share my desktop. It's not simple. Is it clear now? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Start yeah. playing it, please. Yeah. Yes, we can see it now. And that, it's running. Yeah. So uh, after you've got a good hold on the lens, um, please don't move your tip because once you move your tip when you're doing your chopping, there's a high chance of your, you causing an itogenic uh, uh, zonular breaks. So you can see here, the another tip is please do not press too much fake out. Just to uh, you know show you that particular step, you can see the lens, the, the piece is chattering around and instead of just disappearing. So the right amount of uh, power is very, very important. So you can see the rest of the pieces literally in like a few seconds, in a, in, in a second, in fact, uh, just completely disappears. So always remember in your back of your head doesn't, because you, you have more power, by putting more power doesn't mean that you'll do a faster cataract. It doesn't work like that. Okay, come to the next. So this is actually uh, one of my first cases uh, on the Ingenuity system. Uh, this is an intumescent cataract and as you can see, even doing a Rexus on this cataract is super, super easy uh, on the 3D visualization system. Uh, I usually do a smaller Rexus in the beginning, then once I finish the case, I make it a little larger. Again, uh, chopping in this uh, hard cataract uh, is still a breeze and uh, a few tips on uh, how to, uh, let's say, have a nice clear cornea the next day. Now, the first thing is you have to make sure that the phaco tip is in the center. And uh, the second thing is always keep it at the iris plane. The third thing is please do not move your handpiece when you're pressing step three. Now, for instance, uh, uh, I'll show you in the uh, black cataract how, how steady you need to be, especially when you're pressing step three. But in this case, you can see even the visco being washed and this actually illumination is about just about five to 10%, that's all. And with that kind of illumination, you are able to see the visco being washed from the endothelium and which is simply amazing. So if you can see for a second, I hold the posterior capsule and release it. And there wasn't any kind of uh, complication. This can happen only if there is no lag. It's simple as that. If there was lag, then definitely there would be a PCR at the end of the day. So even if you end up with cases like this, like, uh, like a black cataract in your hands, um, actually the centurion system is so beautiful, uh, it, it just uh, uh, simply you know, uh, melts in front of the tip. So it looks like a NS2 uh, grade, it just simply uh, you know, uh, sucks into it. The, 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 the key is, I, I usually do a single-handed uh, FACO, uh, FACO technique. I finish uh, chopping all my pieces and then do it. Now, why I do this is, as you can see in the side port in this region, uh, there is absolutely no leak. When there is no leak, what happens is all there is only one inlet and one outlet. So the uh, inlet is uh, from the irrigation ports and the outlet is through the FACO tip. So that's why the, uh, the fluidics within the anterior chamber is so much more beautiful. So the pieces more come uh, more naturally into the uh, into the tip. All right. So we did a study uh, comparing the visualization and comfort for a surgeon, uh, and also post-operative uh, outcome uh, comparing with the system of uh, Ingenuity and the standard operating microscope. Uh, this was a prospective uh, randomized single uh, sequence study, and uh, we included all grades of cataract, and the age group was between forty to seventy years. Um, we excluded any kind of complicated cataract and we did a detailed examination. Now, um, moving forward. So the main objectives of the study was uh, again to, uh, to compare the visualization and comfort of the surgeon while doing the FACO steps uh, and also to compare the post operative outcomes like corneal edema, anterior chamber cells and so on and so forth. And all were, uh, you know, scaled. So this was the chart which was given to the surgeon um, yeah, 
so this was the uh, once the surgery was done the surgeon was given a chart like this so as to you know uh, so that you can mark all the uh, what kind of experience he had so this was the result what we had where there was a significant low illumination used in the ingenuity as compared to standard micro, uh, operating microscope and there was a significant low brightness used uh, in the 3d system as compared to son now when you look at the comfort uh, the surgeon was so much more comfortable operating on a lower illumination uh, in ingenuity group as compared to a, a standard operating microscope there was no statistically uh, a significant difference uh, while performing uh, the rexus the irrigation aspiration or the lens insertion uh, of both the uh, both the categories uh, the surgeons were very comfortable the surgeons were so much more comfortable in terms of neck comfort was much better in the ingenuity group uh, as compared to the son uh, the next is uh, there was no statistical uh, significance between a corneal edema and anterior chamber cells between the two groups uh, except one surgeon had uh, a lower corneal edema and anterior chamber cells in the ingenuity group as compared to standard operating microscope i like to conclude by saying on the 3d visualization uh, system the surgeon was able to operate at a significantly lesser illumination and brightness provided better neck comfort the patients were significantly more comfortable and automatically they were more cooperative uh, uh, when under the ingenuity system the ingenuity system had a hands on superior tool in training students thank you for your time thank you so much dr narin for such a wonderful presentation and i think uh, most of us who are not, who are not used to or not seen this uh, it, it, it's sort sort of amazing uh, you know you can look rather than looking in you look up and operate it it's it's i think more of a mindset like you have shown uh, that showing so many difficult cases you have been able to manage so smoothly uh, as if it was as like a routine way of visualization so excellent demonstrations uh, Uh, our next speaker, Dr. Anurag Mishra, who doesn't require any introduction, and he's an he's an excellent teacher and an excellent speaker, and I always look forward to uh, his presentations uh, and his uh, teaching pearls. So over to you, Dr. Anurag. Uh, you're you're muted. Dr. Anurag, you're muted. Yes. You can press the Zoom button, sir. First, uh, if you press the Zoom. Yeah, button, I, I think I'm audible now, loud yes. and clear. Thank you so much, Shell. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Greetings and regards from the land of Lord Jagannath. As I take you through a short saga of uh, double impact, the impact is between. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It's not working. Just a moment. so the first click try to do with the mouse sir it should work first click so i take you through a short saga of double impact two systems built into the same console working hand in hand to provide excellent comfort to the surgeon and take your surgical progress to the next level the two systems built into the century and vision system are customizable need based highly efficient fluid flow with incredible cutting efficiency which are subserved by two engineering marvels one of them is the fms and the pump systems combined and the sensor system combined of the centurion system the other is the beautifully angled balance tip which is perfectly suited and gives you the liberty to use it as a horizontal straight tip or a curved tip so without wasting wasting any more time let's go into some of the case scenarios as the time is cut short so we will just run through um three videos instead of uh, five that i had selected the first case scenario is a white cataract as you can see but it is also hiding or veiling a brown nucleus deep inside and this, uh, and to add to that the pupil is small and i have a crazy thought not to use a pupil expanding device in this particular patient the intraocular pressure is set at 30 and the vacuums for 50 the first thing that's of note here is the moment you touch it there is a gush of fluid i call this the aqua sweep technology technique wherein i sweep across with my uh, with my irrigation cannula and then it frees the bag of the intermissions and then you can um, of course go on and carry out the capsular rexus which is of course blind in this case intentionally done a little larger 
so that it allows me space to work with. Now, these sort of mobile brown nucleus, when I try to chop them, I always take the chopper into the equator. It not only gives me the liberty to do a horizontal chopping effectively, but it also supports the mobile nucleus peripherally. So at times the posterior capsule, posterior plate does not budge and it does not give us a clear cleavage, but still we should always go on trying cartwheeling and chop at the same time. At some point in time, it will definitely budge. It will crack. Look at the IOP, keep an eye on it. It's set at 30, but you would not find any chamber instability whatsoever. The pupil's perilously small, but you are standing right at the middle. You're walking inside the bag. Of course, there's a bit of experience and a bit of learning curve included uh, in getting to the equator of the nucleus every time, but that comes with practice, not a problem at all. So now we start uh, uh, emulsifying the pieces. This is an unedited video. I've just sped up the speed for time constraints, but this pupil, whatever size it assumes, you still do not feel the necessity of putting in a pupil expander here. The moment the CDE touches somewhere around 15 to 20 though, I tend to stop, refill the anterior chamber with dispersive viscoelastic just to have an additional protection of the endothelial layer and then carry on uh, with my procedure. You need to stay right at the middle, look at the pupil, it's not fluttering, it's not attempting to get engaged into phaco needle. You just have to stay at the center, the IOP remains at 30, so the patient enjoys the comfort of low fluidics in the eye, and then the case is, the nucleus management is over. The next case that we would be talking about is a posterior polar cataract shell, beautifully demonstrated all the steps. So what you need to do is to construct a CCC right at the center, should there be a need of a sulcus implant later on. There's hardly any nucleus to, I did not do a femto in this particular case, but I completely agree with the concept that we had just explained. You do a hydrodelineation, basically what the pneumatics do uh, to, uh, in flax to the same kind of uh, patient profile. You aspirate the endonucleus, which is hardly anything. The IOP here is in, uh, is in the range of 20, but it will increase as we progress, as you will see. After getting through with the nucleus, the epinucleus plate is then stripped off the periphery. The, uh, the central plaque is not touched at all. A bimanual irrigation aspiration is then employed to clear out whatever remains. There, the IOP escalates to 46 because we are through with the nucleus. We need to have some more pressure for falling anteriorly. Now, this patient also needed a T6 toric implant. Before withdrawing the irrigation cannula, you do need to put in visco, but I do not like to see viscoelastic even a drop in my toric implant. So what do I do here? I do inject visco before taking out the irrigation though, but I burp out the visco before implanting the IOL as I do here. You can see a posterior plaque sitting right there. The IOP has been escalated to 55. The toric implant goes in, occupies its position in the back, we rotate it to occupy uh, the axis parallel to its desired plane. Now we have to remove the posterior plaque for which we do not need the help of any viscoelastic whatsoever. Keep under BSS, go through the side port. Shell mentioned the 23 gauge microrexis grabber forceps. I use that under the cover of BSS itself. Since you have the support of the IOL as well, you don't need to worry about vitreous loss at all in this case, but under the cover of BSS, which which provides a bloated anterior chamber, just like a visco would have done, you peel off the membrane along with the central PC plaque. So now you have an opening, a clear visual axis, rotate the lens back into the desired axis and leave it there for the patient to do exceedingly well in the post-operative period. This is also a young patient with posterior polar cataract. Uh, we'll not go into the next video, but I would certainly like to show, I mean, I, uh, Naren has already beautifully demonstrated a hard leathery cataract, so I'll not go into this. Uh, I would just like to speak about the challenge to the extreme, since there is a comparison between the Centurion vision system and a lot of other FACO machines at times. So what if we challenge the machine to the extreme and see how it performs? The extreme situation is nothing related to the cataract. This is a very routine cataract, but what you see here is, this VSS left in the bag is 10 milliliters. So can we go ahead and finish off at least the nucleus management with 10 milliliters of fluid in the bag? The IOP is set at 20. Let's begin the real time video. You see a 20 value of 20 here just because the bag was pressed. But so this is how we proceeded. No hurry at all. 
With the 20 IOP also, the anterior chamber remains rock solid. Nothing comes as a difficulty when it comes to negotiating the nucleus in the back. We finish off uh, uh, the, uh, the chopping in a jiffy, go on to the, uh, uh, the quad removal mode. The IOP remains at 20. One by one, the pieces are consumed as if they are begging to be emulsified, dislodged out of the back. The fluid comes perilously close to being empty, but look at the machine support. It gives you support till the last drop of PSS in the back. Now you can see a value of zero here, but still we continue and finish off the nucleus management in this particular case. So that's how we challenge it to the extreme. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Shell. Stay safe. Koronamaskar. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much once again for those excellent videos and uh, I would like to invite Dr. Jan Shusain Gupta uh, to come up with this presentation and while he uh, starts sharing, I, uh, what I found very, very, very drastic difference with the new balance tip compared to the previous tip is, is the tremendous improve in efficiency during lens removal. So particularly, uh, the, you know, quite often we would have to use 80, 90, 100 uh, ozil uh, very often. Now we hardly need to go beyond 60 or 70. And yeah. the CDE drops down by at least 30 to 35%. So I think that's been one of the major stark differences that I've found while changing the tape. That's because of the robust you, difference in the uh, stroke length share. The stroke length has Correct. really increased tremendously. Correct. Over to you, Jankshu. Dr. Shell, yeah. uh, just a gentle uh, so reminder, today, uh, we have only we have a shortage of time. And I will, uh, uh, today we are going to speak about the active century. There is a new handpiece uh, which is uh, marketed by Alcon and it's going to which has been incorporated with the Centurion vision system. In this, we have a shift in the pressure sensor from the uh, inline to the uh, to the hand fist and along with the quick bulb technology is supposed to mitigate the surge happening during the surgery. Now, in this situation, I have kept a very standard setting of 46 IOP and an aspiration of around 40 with a vacuum of 600. And this is preferred by majority of the surgeons across the country. And uh, we find that uh, the chamber is absolutely stable. And uh, the uh, we have to remember at this point of time, just like a typist uh, makes a typo, the pecan emulsification is also linked to surge, which limits our parameter selections depending on the machines as well as the anti-surge mechanism and also the surgeon factors irrespective of the skill. So, we see that uh, the fecal emulsification, obviously, as uh, has been pointed out, the nuclear pieces just melts like butter in front of the uh, fecal tip. And actually, the gradation, uh, the, there should be a separate centurion gradation for the catheters that we are handling. So we can see that the, at the, at the, we are towards the end of the surgery, the last phase, and without decreasing the speed of the surgery, we can just uh, go ahead with the emulsifying the last phase, which many people say that uh, we should calm down, bring down the parameters and uh, do this and uh, to keep it uh, uh, for the ensuring the safety. But here we do not need to change anything. We just carry on with that and we complete the procedure. So I will just go towards the end, uh, a little bit towards the end because uh, I'd like to show you the anti-surge mitigation which took place during uh, the surge. Uh, see that the FECO, uh, the total CD is only 2.46 for a uh, grade two cataract and the uh, number of times the uh, anti-surge mechanism has acted upon is only five with a consumption of only 40 cc of water. I will just move to the uh, move to the second video, which is actually uh, one of my uh, favorite settings that I prefer. It is a, uh, uh, in this, uh, it is a, it is a 20 uh, IOP with an aspiration of uh, 60 and a vacuum of 700, the bench setting of the machine. And at this point of time, what we find that it is a real test of the horsepower of the Centurion machine and whether this, uh, whether this uh, shifting of the tick sensor, uh, shifting of the sensor to the hand piece, whether this is all going to work is challenged. So uh, we are going to see whether the machine is going to stumble or whether, and whether the road is going to be bumpy in this uh, when we shift to a uh, uh, active sentry uh, hand piece uh, and when we actually dissociate the entire setting from a very low IRP to a very high aspiration fall associated with a very high vacuum system. We find that the holdability is very good. The pieces are cracked easily. The CD is rising and at all varying uh, 
the aspiration is very stable and the IOP is well maintained all throughout the procedure at work, while working at the very high uh, uh, vacuum that we have kept in. And even at the last phase, we find that the machine has uh, just dealt with the whole thing smoothly and without, uh, without any fluctuation of the uh, chamber at this point of time. So if we go towards the end, we will see how much is the... Uh, we will find that the, uh, the anti-surge mitigation has only happened but once, which was without our observation also, because uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is where the surgeon is absolutely comfortable. And next, we will go to a third video, which is uh, basically a, uh, of a mature cataract. Uh, we'll switch to the uh, FECO portion only. You see, we have a very, hard, very good grip. We have... Uh, holdability, the vacuum builds up very fast and stable, and uh, we can have a uh, the, we can have the crack without any fluctuation. So this is where the safety of the machine uh, is important. The, uh, what what we can expect at this point of time with the active sentry handpiece is we have faster removal of the cat thread. We have a reduced energy delivery as we are shifting from a uh, from an energy driven surgery to a fluid driven surgery. We have obviously a very enhanced functional efficiency from the balance state. And we can also look into the cumulative dissipated energy that is the CD count, uh, which uh, at the end of the surgery, which allows us to work at real sub uh, 10 or sub 15 levels, even with the very hard cataract. And obviously during the entire procedure, one annoying thing which does not happen uh, with this particular machine is the regular repulsion and also as Anurag also showed uh, in his video that we can work with very uh, very low fluid volumes uh, uh, in uh, performing this surgery. If we look into this, uh, uh, if we look into this, see it's only a uh, it's only a uh, 83 cc of fluid has been consumed with 40 percent torsion and we have not used any of the longitudinal power. The anti-surge mitigation has not, uh, it, it did not need to be activated. That is the stability of the machine at very high powers. So it is just, a, uh, it is just like my autocorrect option in the, uh, in my keyboard. It just, uh, uh, it just needs to activate when I make a mistake. So if I do not make a mistake, it doesn't get activated. If I do a mistake, it is protecting my back. And doing a sub 10 uh, uh, CD with 40% uh, uh, energy and of 83 cc of fluid uh, consumption, I think the machine uh, has got a real uplift with the uh, inclusion of the active sentry handpiece. Thank you. I think I should be ending over here because of uh, lack Thank of you time. so much, Dr. Jayanshu, for this wonderful presentation. And just to sum up in a minute, uh, the uh, uh, excellent videos by everyone. So I think a combination of technique and technology, uh, the, the technology highlights being and improved in the FACO tip, which improves in the efficiency of lens removal, lesser requirement of power, lesser CD, therefore less collateral damage inside. Right? Uh, the second is the improvement of the IOP sensor in the probe, the active center, uh, which means that the IOP at the moment is being measured at the cassette level. So those few microseconds are being saved that should help improve the response in a very changing situation. In a routine situation, you may argue that it doesn't really make huge uh, difference, but particularly for surgeons who are using higher parameters, 500, 600, 700 vacuum, we just recently published our data comparing lower parameters versus higher parameters where the active sentry showed a definite improvement in surgeons who are using higher parameters. Uh, and I think the stability of the IOL platforms, as was highlighted beautifully by Dr. Mishra as well, uh, that even in open capsules, if you have a slowly unfolding IOL and an IOL which has a very strong track record of stability, you can go ahead even in these several special situations with open posterior capsules, stable bags, without the fear of long-term rotation or long-term stability of these aisles. So I think I would like to sum up uh, the session, these three important uh, uh, points. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I apologize for the delay no, no, no. in the starting Shail. the next session and uh, uh, Shail, handing I, over to you, Dr. Maniya, sir. Shail, can I, can I give you a comment here, if you don't mind? Sure, sure, sir. This great, is, great, uh, sure. The, 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 the point here is essentially of fluidics Correct. and better and safer fluidics. And um, I will exhort all of you to also consider putting in an AC maintainer even during your FACOs. The prediction 
of your fluid movement is absolutely absolutely predictable and uh, absolutely safe especially with an ac maintainer so maybe some of you might want to try that even with an old system but with an ac maintainer you you have a lot of safety thank Wonderful you sir. thank, thank you, you so thank much you. thanks shell great show